Hello and welcome to Red Reads. Today I'm going to talk about probably a new favourite novel, uh, almost definitely one of I think the most beautiful novels that I have read in recent in recent years and uh, I think it'll be a long time before I come across another character that I feel such a strong affinity for as uh, Bill William Willie Stoner. Uh, the novel is Stoner by John Williams, uh, not the composer or the guitarist and yeah that's uh, I think it's a perfect book. I uh, it is as uh, shown by this garish fake sticker on the front, the greatest novel you've never read, uh, which it should, there should be like some magic that it just, that these fake stickers evaporate uh, as soon as you've read and you actually own the books. But anyway, I guess that's just what a, an actual sticker would do. You could just peel it off. But yeah, anyway, the idea, the plot, I am going to read some extracts and talk about it and I'll save some of the plot for as I go through. I will say that uh, if you haven't read the book, um, it is like, it is just the story of, of a man, William Stoner's life. And so uh, pretty much like, I'll just try and rapid fire it. Coming from being a farm boy, he goes to university to study agriculture, falls in love with English literature instead, goes on and completes his course, uh, be becomes a teacher, gets married, gets married basically to the wrong woman, uh, goes on, and then the rest of the book is just uh, kind of the rest of his life as it develops in this main campus setting. So he starts to have an affair with another, uh, uh, with, a, with a co-worker. He has these sort of office politics where there's this guy who's this uh, kind of upper teacher who's really really just trying to get rid of him. And we go on all the way through uh, until William Stoner's death at the very end. But uh, the, the reason why uh, it's okay to sort of know all this is that really in the first page, uh, uh, Williams decides and I'm realizing that it's gonna set. It's gonna be weird me saying Williams talking about the author, or is it gonna be like William apostrophe s talking about the character? But uh, I'll just say I'll say John Williams just to make sure it's it's clear going forward. He uses a storytelling device of basically saying uh, from the beginning, from page one, uh, talking about. William Stoner entering the University of Missouri as a freshman in 1910 talks about him being in uh, uh, talks about him uh, getting his doctorate during the war but then very specifically talks about him passing away in 1956 so this is the the second sentence of the book talks about how he passes away and so uh, and the extract that I got from this first page is Stoner's colleagues, who held him in no particular esteem when he was alive, speak of him rarely now. To the older ones, his name is a reminder of the end that awaits them all, and to the younger ones, it is merely a sound which evokes no sense of the past and no identity with which they can associate themselves or their careers. And so it starts off like that, seeming a little bit sad and very like, oh my god, what is this guy? He's left low, no legacy. It's obviously been a wasted life. But I think that... In the same way, the same, uh, a similar technique as in The Bluest Eye when Toni Morrison basically comes out of the gate and says, okay, this is what happened to this girl and this is who did it to her. And now we're going to go on to tell the rest of the story uh, about these people and we all know where it's leading. Uh, I think that what uh, kind of establishing that William Stoner uh, is dead and that this is a story being written after the fact or, or it's a story being written with that information in mind it's kind of just telling you that you're meant to take everything that's happening as how it contributes to his entire legacy so you know moments of him getting married and not just him getting married they are him making a definitive choice that you're meant to look at in the context of his entire life and career which i guess that's kind of something that you will inevitably do anyway if you're reading a book because it's kind of established like if it's written in past tense all this stuff pr like happened um but i feel like the fact that uh, John Williams included this as in the first chapter and he didn't just start from, you know, the second part, uh, you know, he was born in 1891 on a small farm in central Missouri. Um, he's kind of consciously, deliberately telling you, like, this is going to be a story about the totality of a person. And yeah, I think he does a really great job. So 
I'll skip forward now and I'll just start reading extracts uh, that uh, insofar as they relate to the plot. One of the things I like, I really like, I absolutely love uh, John Williams's prose and I am very excited to go on and read Augustus even though I know that it's a kind of totally different story and even people are saying that it's a very different style um, but I feel like he has a really excellent way of describing people and sort of a balance of here's their physical description but then here's also sort of their essence or their idea uh, insofar as it insofar as it related to uh, uh, William Stoner but yeah the style of writing the style of prose that I got was like similar to Christopher Isherwood but I very much uh, liked uh, John Williams's uh, approach so he's talking about the teacher Archer Sloan this is going to be the most seminal person in introducing uh, uh, the love of English language through the Shakespeare sonnet to him and it's talking about the instructor uh, and he came to his task of teaching with a seeming disdain and contempt as if he perceived between his knowledge and what he could say a gulf so profound that he would make no effort to close it and you read something like that you think about your times in university and you're just like oh yeah I've I've met people like this and uh, I've met you know lecturers like this but then really the great the great moment that comes a couple of days later he's reading uh, Shakespeare's sonnet and let me just confirm which number it's Shakespeare's 73rd sonnet the one that ends uh, this thou perceivest uh, which makes thy love more strong to love that well which thou must air must leave ere long and uh, just following that uh, there's it's such a it's such a real moment. I had this, you know, uh, so many people they might read like Catcher in the Rye, or they'll read uh, Infinite Jest, or they'll read uh, The Bell Jar, and they'll just be like, "Oh, this character is so me." But I got that this character is so me with William Stoner. I feel like I said at the start such a strong affinity for him because there's just the moment in class where he is, uh, he and every other student is just glazed eyed. They're not they're not paying attention, they're really struggling to focus on what uh, Archer Sloan is telling them, and Archer just uh, looks, uh, Sloan just looks at William Stoner and says, Mr. Shakespeare speaks to you across 300 years, Mr. Stoner, do you hear him? And like, I didn't, I didn't study literature or language or anything in uh, university, I studied music, but just having this idea of like that profound, like, oh yeah, this is what I'm doing, and I have like just I'm finally hearing them speak to me and I'm realizing uh, I thought that Williams uh, conveyed that so well just in one line uh, Shakespeare is Shakespeare is speaking to you do you hear him there are some there are some po points of really beautiful writing I, I feel like for the most part uh, the book in my memory I remember as having very sort of just clear punctual to the point uh, prose but there is some beautiful stuff so he's talking about uh, reading like the process of reading and sort of imagining uh, like images forming in the darkness and then uh, but then he writes this the past gathered out of the darkness where it stayed and the dead raised themselves to life uh, before him and the past and the dead flowed into the present among the alive so that he had for an intense in instant a vision of denseness into which he was compacted and from which he could not escape and had no wish to escape and then just goes on and lists some more of a uh, list some characters that are having a big influence on him and he uh uh, Williams does a does a great job in kind of portraying this idea of if you come from a culture where uh, you're maybe not like your parents didn't go to university and you start to feel this gulf between them he he describes it really well basically in the next paragraph sometimes he thought of himself as he had been a few years before and was astonished by the memory of that strange figure brown and passive as the earth from which it had emerged he thought of his parents and and they were nearly as strange as the child they had born he felt a mixed he felt a mixed pity for them and a distant love and yeah that's something that i think anyone you know uh, any of us who have been to uni university we at least feel that with regards to looking back at our old self and like physically i realize that you know i've not changed that much but when i think about the intellectual developments like the gulf is so far that uh, thinking about past even 
three, four year old versions of myself, I'm like, wow, it's a, a totally different person. And then, of course, uh, for someone who's coming to literature later in his life, <clears throat> sometimes, immersed in his books, there would come to him the awareness of all that he did not know and all that he had not read, and the serenity for which he laboured was shattered as he realised the little time he had in life to read so much to learn what he had to know. Oh my god. Just so me. So me. Jeez. Now, this is an interesting thing, and I, I found... Uh, I enjoyed the way in which he kind of uh, developed the really doomed from the start relationship with him and his wife. So he kind of sees her and he's physically attracted to her. He's he's maybe very attracted to just an idea of her. Uh, his wife, the woman he goes on to marry, is named uh, Edith Elaine Bostwick. And uh, uh, just to set the stage, here's how... Here's how John Williams describes her. She was educated upon the premise that she would be protected from the gross events that life might thrust in her way, and upon the premise that she had no other duty than to be a graceful and accomplished accessory to that protection, since she belonged to a social and economic class to which protection was an almost sacred obligation. And then... Uh, and... So what happens is that they go on, they have a marriage, and there is even a quote uh, later on where uh, he says, basically, uh, he knew that uh, our character, Stoner, knew that uh, the marriage was doomed within like a month, but within a year, he, decide he stopped uh, saying that he wanted it to be better. And the way that it develops, it's, it's so just... It, it is insidious because there are times when you will just be so utterly angry at Edith because she has this, you know, she just randomly decides that she wants to have a baby, but then because uh, she's ill, allegedly, uh, she doesn't, uh, a lot of the caretaking duties are passed over to William Stoner, so he basically raises his the, their daughter Grace for the first years of her life, but then after, you know, basically after the baby stops smelling like shit, uh, the, uh, Edith, Edith decides that, oh, she just wants to be the, the dominant care, caregiver now, and so she comes in, she create, she uh, puts this big rift in between them, and I thought that the way that Grace, the daughter, uh, developed, even though she's off screen for quite a lot of the time, it's, it's really, really organic, and there are some absolutely touching moments uh, in the very end of them trying to sort of reconnect despite this this gulf that the mother has put between them and usually I'm usually it's always a sour point whenever I am reading a book and the main character basically enters into a love affair because it's always just like ugh, you know it, it's it's always the guy that gets to go and have the love affair and uh, and so it can be a bit annoying but really there are some like you can kind of see you can see the logic by it in just in the sense that this relationship was doomed from the start. They almost never, they were never intimate. They were sleeping in, in separate beds. And even early on, uh, when a lot of the, uh, a lot of the games are very explicitly known to uh, Stoner, he just comes out and says, you know, you really hate me, don't you? And, sh and Grace uh, oh, sorry, Edith is kind of dodging around the thing, but it's just saying, yeah, but you'll never leave me because, you know, the divorce will be so messy. So he's sort of trapped, but he's just like, he bears it. He's like a mule. He just bears the burden and he just keeps going on. And you will, I, I think you will really, really resonate with um, just how willing he is to keep going and to be, oh, yeah, anyway. And another just sort of way of describing the death at some point, uh, Archer Sloan, the teacher who brought uh, Stoner into the, really showed him the love of literature, passes away. And uh, Williams writes, the coroner announced heart failure as the cause of death, but William Stoner always felt that in a moment of anger and despair, Sloan had willed his heart to seize, as if in a last mute gesture of love and contempt for a world that had betrayed him so profoundly that he could not endure in it. And coming to uh, a clarity on really what the state of his marriage is like, uh, he writes... 
It was finally himself that he held responsible for the new direction her life had taken, her, her being Edith, his wife. Uh, he had been unable to discover for her any meaning in their life together, in their marriage. Thus, it was right for her to take what meaning she could find in areas that had nothing to do with him and go ways he could not follow. And I'm just like, oh, why are you being such a self-sacrificing... Why are you being such a martyr, dude? Why are you not just admitting that this woman is toxic and terrible for you? A lot of the novel goes into uh, university office politics, and so there's really this big one where there's this kind of radical student, Walker, who he is... Uh, Stoner is pretty content to fail because he's demonstrated, like, a, a lack of understanding in very kind of obvious or core areas, but he's also, um, basically he's, uh, this student has gone out and criticized or attacked another student, which is, would just put a bad taste in anybody's mouth. But what had happened was that they get into this interaction and I thought that, uh, Williams described this sort of moment really, really well. I'll just read it and then talk about it. Stoner became aware that he was in the presence of a bluff so colossal and bold that he had no ready means of dealing with it. And that is such a perfect, brilliant way of articulating that idea when sometimes you're just in a, in a argument or a conversation with somebody and you're so absolutely flabbergasted that they're actually saying the things that they're saying that you're like, I don't even know because you can't just, because of like saving face and coming out, you can't just come out and call them out completely and kind of negate the conversation because that's just going to re devolve into I don't want to talk to you anymore uh, which is not a very mature thing but uh, when you it's like sometimes you can just realize that this is ridiculous like what is going on and in just one sentence you know there are so many just one sentence lines that Williams writes that perfectly encapsulate this idea that you feel Ready for the ready for the midlife crisis midlife crisis start of chapter twelve. <clears throat> During that year, and especially in the winter months, he found himself returning more and more frequently to such a state of unreality. At will, he seemed able to remove his consciousness from the body that contained it, and he observed himself as if he were an oddly familiar stranger, doing the oddly familiar things that he had to do. It was a dissociation... It was a dissociation... I always say that word wrong. I say disassociation, but it's dissociation, which I think they're two different words. Anyway, a uh, dissociation that he had never felt before. Uh, he knew that he ought to be troubled by it but he was numb and he could not convince himself that it mattered he was 42 years old and he could and he could see nothing before him that he wished to enjoy and little behind him that he cared to remember talking about a midlife crisis so my god and then establishing so uh, like i said he goes on to have an affair with a co-worker catherine catherine driscoll and uh, he starts by, he's just sort of supervising her, giving advice on uh, uh, on the PhD that she's working on, and he's going to her house. He starts to realize that the relationship is, uh, you know, is a bit of a, a forbidden fruit, can't, and can't continue and so he stops going and then she calls in ill and he goes to her house and this has got to be a classic romance line. I didn't think I would get one of these in this book, but she says... Uh, <clears throat> He goes to her house and sees her and she looks a bit haggard and he, he says, I'm sorry, you're ill if there's anything I can. And then she interrupts and says, I am not ill, she said. And she added in a voice that was calm, speculative, almost uninterested. I am desperately, desperately unhappy. Oh my gosh. Man, this, this entire, the entire process, let me tell you, I read this book basically in an unbroken eight hour binge read and my heart was just consistently melting for William Stoner. I, yeah, gosh. He's uh, a bit later on, this is a couple of pages later, uh, he's meditating sort of on what it is that like kind of imbues him with this quality, this stoic quality that makes him able to keep going on. But it's also simultaneously a meditation on like legacy and where he's coming from. And I'll read it. 
But William Stoner knew of a world in a way that few of his younger colleagues could understand. Deep in him, beneath his memory, was the knowledge of hardship and hunger and endurance and pain. Uh, though he seldom thought of his early years on the Booneville farm, uh, which is where he's from, uh, there was always near to his consciousness a blood knowledge of his inheritance, given him by forefathers whose lives were obscure, obscure and hard and stoic, and whose common ethic was to present to an oppressive world faces that that were expressionless and hard and bleak. And at that time, he's also sort of meditating. Uh, he didn't go to World War I, but some friends of his did. And right now at this point, uh, World War II is about to start. Another really beautiful prose description. This is, uh, this is um, Stoner reflecting on his daughter. Near, quite close, near to the end of the novel, actually. She was, he knew, and had known very early, he supposed, one of those rare and always lovely humans whose moral nature was so delicate that it must be nourished and cared for that it might be fulfilled. Alien to the world, it had to live where it could not be at home, avid for tender tenderness and quiet. It had to feed upon indifference and callousness and noise. It was a nature that, even in the strange and inimical place where it had lived, had not the savagery to fight off the brutal forces that opposed it and could only withdraw to a quietness where it was forlorn and small and gently still. Oh, God. Man, I don't even know if I can keep going. My, I'm just gonna... Uh, yeah. And later on, later on, this might be one of the last uh, extracts that I read because I'll save just on the off chance, just on the off chance that you haven't heeded my advice and you have not actually read it, I will save the very end. But this is a another long but reflecting on his life uh, passage that really touched me. But he was not beyond in brackets, the force of passion, of love. He knew and would never be. Uh, beneath the numbness, the indifference, the removal, it was there, intense and steady. It had always been there. In his youth, he had given it freely, without thought. He had given it to the knowledge that had been revealed to him how many years ago by Arch Sloan. Uh, he had given it to Edith in those first blind, foolish days of his courtship and marriage. And he had given it to Catherine as if it had n never been given before. He had, in odd ways, given it to every moment of his life, and had perhaps given it most fully when he was unaware of giving it. It was a passion neither of the mind nor of the flesh. Rather, it was a force that comprehended them both as if they were but the matter of love, its specific substance. To a woman or to a poem, it simply said, Look, I am alive. Oh, God. I, I think this is going to be bumped up. This is probably going to be a book that, uh, when I stop being... Uh, when I uh, stop being seduced by all of the new books and I finally decide that I want to start rereading in earnest, uh, that is a book that is going to be high up on the list. Um, let me know if there are some uh, extra things, extra things that you wanted to point out. I know I skipped over a lot of uh, other plot stuff and a lot of the uh, kind of affair, but uh, it is also, again, just in case you haven't read it, uh, those are some of the really core parts of the book. So uh, I wanted to sort of leave them out and leave them for you. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and yeah, I'll see you in the next video.